So uh, the intention is to give you an overview of the annual meeting in figures. Uh, you saw a first overview of this uh, in a summary by Daria yesterday, but I thought I'd go into a few more details. There were 52 submissions and we actually had 161 authors of those 52 submissions. 37 papers were accepted and there were still 98 authors left. Um, and they were distributed over 20 oral presentations and 17 posters. And uh, the attendance registrations, as Daria pointed out, is uh, from 180, were on 882 persons uh, that uh, attend the conference and 74 virtually and from 36 countries. We have handed out the Stephen Crower Award and there will be a Best PhD Student Poster Award and the Teaching with Clarin Award. And uh, a number of pre-conference meetings and uh, post-conference workshops. Uh, at least currently, there are still two keynotes um, uh, and five topics for uh, the uh, agenda. The three special sessions are using Clarin in training, and the PhD session, and the Clarin Bazaar at the end of today. Um, if we compare with uh, previous years, I mean, the, the maybe mainly due to COVID, the submission rate was uh, rather low. Uh, uh, and now we have more than ever. Uh, so 250% uh, increase almost. And with that, we also were slightly stricter with accepting papers. So the, a slightly smaller acceptance rate. It meant that we had to produce a uh, rather large number of reviews uh, because we really wanted to have three reviews per submission. Um, you can also look at the number of authors per submission and the most popular type seems to be three authors per submission. Uh, but there was even one uh, submission with 12 authors and uh, seven submissions with only one author. And uh, Daria showed you an attendance per country, but this is a number of submissions uh, per country. And here, uh, Germany has 7.6. <laughs> well, that's because the authorship is uh, distributed uh, so that you don't count uh, a full authorship uh, if there are several authors. Uh, well, that was the... Uh, conference in overview and I hand over to Vincent. So welcome in Leuven. Um, this is Fonske, a uh, famous uh, statue in Leuven. He's representing the fountain of wisdom while pouring beer or water in his brain. This is immediately the, uh, the two things for which uh, Leuven is most famous for its university and for its beer. Um, the reason why we're in Leuven is quite coincidentally, about a year ago, I was walking around in, in Leiden in the Netherlands and um, I was walking to the station and um, suddenly some woman on a bike stopped me and said, can you do the next Clarion conference in Belgium? And uh, that was Francisca. I didn't recognize her immediately because she had a, a bonnet on. And um, so, yeah, a year later, here we are. Um, so be aware when walking around in Leiden, you <laughs> you might uh, take some stuff on your head. Uh, Leuven is the capital of the uh, province of Flemish Brabant. Uh, it has 100 in inhabitants, about 30,000 in the city center. Uh, so inside of the ring, and and now we're, we're in the student year, so that's an extra forty thousand uh, students uh, living here, as well. Um, I don't have a lot to say. Yeah, we're in the Irish College. It's a former campus of the seventeenth-century Irish Franciscan College. Um, it's 
an independent institution has nothing to do with the university. Of course, it is here because of the university, but there is no formal link. Um, this is also why we could rent the place um, because the university is too busy. All the rooms are too busy with uh, 40,000 students. Um, and um, so um, I welcome you here in Leuven. Um, I hope you enjoy the city. We already had a, a little taste of it yesterday with the city hall and the, the domus. Uh, tonight we go to the Beguinage and um, yeah. The other attractions would be the church maybe, but um, we're not going to go yet. We're not going to go there. We're already here in the churchish uh, building. So uh, welcome to Leuven and uh, I give the floor to the next speaker. Now we'll uh, go through uh, some presentations of the committees, but uh, to put the committees into context, uh, I thought uh, we'd say something about the organigram uh, of uh, Clarin. And we can start in the uh, upper corner with the General Assembly. So uh, when a country joins uh, Clarin Eric, they uh, actually join the General Assembly uh, with the uh, ministerial representatives. And their uh, task is to approve the budget and they uh, have a meeting once a year. And uh, the money then uh, from uh, the contributions uh, nationally go to fund uh, this uh, left side uh, pillar from your point of view. It's the board of directors and the Claudin office. And uh, in addition to that, the uh, countries also, I mean, the, the General Assembly cannot uh, possibly supervise uh, all the activities. They usually, the representatives there have several research infrastructures that they tend to. So the country also appoints a national coordinator to uh, be in charge of the national consortia. Uh, so they coordinate things within the country, but then they also need to coordinate between themselves and that they do uh, in, uh, the National Coordinators Forum. And in addition to that, they of course need to coordinate the activities with uh, what's happening at the Nash, uh, central hub, that is the Clarion Office and the Board of Directors. But all of this uh, uh, activity with the National Coordinators and the Standing Committee and the Thematic Committee, these are in-kind contributions by the country to uh, the full uh, Clarin Eric. Uh, then all of this uh, needs to be supervised somehow uh, or evaluated with, uh, 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 and that is the task of the scientific advisory board. So they are independent of the funding that is uh, run, uh, running from the general assembly and of the national uh, activities that are provided in kind and then they give recommendations to the general assembly to uh, how to further develop the infrastructure so that's in a nutshell uh, uh, the organization of uh, Clarin Eric and now um, uh, I as national coordinator chair uh, can say something about what uh, the National Coordinators Forum has done uh, this year. And uh, as I pointed out, uh, we mainly provide coordination and cooperation. Uh, so uh, the output from this particular committee is not that exciting. I mean, we promoted knowledge centers and networking. We invited committee chairs for talks and uh, shared regional and thematic activities, best practices, and we also created the Clarence strategy and budget, or at least uh, participated in uh, creating it. And then we did knowledge sharing uh, between ourselves, we did case studies, and we also put in proposals to fund the national consortia, and uh, heard monthly reports from the BOD. But if you want to think of something that we achieved at least, uh, I mean, these were activities, 
we improved the communication between ourselves. We made small changes this year to the meeting uh, practices. We selected the, the Clarin awardees and created a work plan and appointed some committee members. And last but not least, we uh, devised the annual meeting program that you are currently enjoying. Uh, the ongo ongoing activities, I mean, we're uh, still updating the strategy and uh, we are working on the work plan for next year. And we intend to maximize the mutual benefit there by sharing best practices and aligning national activities. And uh, fresh out of the oven, uh, yesterday we uh, decided on the key goals that we were going to promote uh, next year. Uh, and towards our users, we will develop and share knowledge about how to use large language models. That was really uh, considered an important task over the next year uh, for um, Clarin. And uh, then improve the coverage and quality of data, better integrate case centers into the bigger picture and improve interoperability. These are things that we want to do with our offering. And in our landscape, we want to reinforce Clarin as a key enabler of state-of-the-art research fields working with language data, but then also share, collaborate and align national agendas and extend and reinforce membership in Cloud and Eric and uh, work on branding and visibility. So these are uh, the goals. Um, yeah. A lot of cooperation and coordination. But uh, the other committees uh, have more concrete things uh, to present to you, um, uh, hopefully. Uh, so we will go to the uh, standing committee. Yeah, thank you, Krista. Yes, my name is uh, Martin Matthiesen, and I'm from uh, FinClarin also, from CSC in Finland. And I will be um, presenting now the uh, Standards Committee's slides. So our <clears throat> key achievements, uh, we meet quite regularly. And uh, this year we could uh, welcome Switzerland and Spain um, as new members to our committee. And I would also like to um, um mention that we uh, now have um increased the uh or improved the preparation of the meetings we have uh, um regular meetings with the uh, vice chair Leif Joran Olson from Sweden and uh Julia Miserski from uh, the Claren head office in Dita and uh we um had a questionnaire a devised a questionnaire about cross border backups um for the NCF and have increased our cooperation with the Core Trust Seal Board, um, which is a very um, important certification for Clarin Key Centers, and also include uh, improved collaboration with the uh, Standards and Interoperability Committee and the NCF, as, Dita, as uh, um, Krista mentioned. And we've also taken part in the uh, pr um, preparation of the Clarin strategy. So our ongoing activities, um, we still meet uh, uh, monthly on a monthly basis, we just met um, yesterday. We are reporting to the NCF and um, we are the, um, I would say, a main contact point for task forces and interest groups. And I'll um, show you a slightly busy slide about them. So we have a metadata. Uh, task force, uh, federated content search task force, and two interest groups about uh, Fedora and uh, users of Corp. And for the uh, Corp interest group, we are still looking for a coordinator. So please let me know if you're interested. The key goals and plans for 2024 are still a draft because we would like to really base them on the final version of the strategy. We have now... Um, <coughs> based uh, them on a preliminary version and uh, discussed them just yesterday as well. And we'll finalize them the next meeting. And I can say uh, that the first three uh, bullet points are fairly un were fairly uncontroversial. So, so we want to still um, concentrate on improving the federated content search. 
and also uh, our um, improve the um, use of of the core trust seal. Um, we need to we need to improve uh, com com communication with with the CTS board and. Um, our ongoing uh, activity is uh, in supporting centers and ac actively as existing member states uh, to become B centers and also existing B centers. I mean that is one of the main main reason to uh, exist for for this um, committee and also proactively help new centers to convert to CMDI. And um, the um, sort of um, uh, less, uh, if you will, uh, clear, or or we are not sure whether we can achieve all this in 2024. Um, are um, improving in accessibility of the centers, and uh, the issue of the cross border backups, and the uh, in supporting um, more supporting the Claren resource families. And this uh, was all from my side, and I think. Dieter, you will be presenting, yeah? Yes, thank you. Um, good morning. I'm standing in today for Mansu Windho, who is the uh, chair of the uh, Center Assessment Committee, but unfortunately oh. couldn't be here today. So I'll try to give you a bit of insight in what the uh, Center Assessment Committee is doing and has been doing particularly this year. Um, so first of all, um, a quick recap of what the assessment procedure looks like. So this is for the B centers that are going through um, the procedure. First of all, the centers submit kind of self-assessment um, by filling in a document and uh, yeah, making it uh, suitable to the specifics of uh, the center. Then an evaluation takes place um, as set by the um, uh, committee. Um, so basically the, the center assessment committee is checking what the centers have uh, yeah, responded in the self-assessment uh, procedure. And then uh, after some back and forth, usually um, this leads to a kind of conditional B-Center uh, certificate, uh, conditional on the granting of the core trust seal uh, certificates. Um, and that's something that generally takes a little bit longer. So as you might know, this is a separate procedure. You submit um, something uh, yeah, in terms of uh, the, the questionnaire that you get from the court trust seal to the court trust okay. seal committee and uh, again there's some kind of iterations back and forth at the end hopefully uh, that seal is granted and then you become an official clarence center it's um it's a bit of work but then you can uh yeah be proud on your status as b center for three years this is um, a graphical overview of uh, where the centers who have submitted in which phase they are. And you can see it's gradually transitioning from a phase where uh, first only the self-assessment is there to the phase where uh, the self-assessment and uh, the B center check has been taken place. And then finally, also the core trust seal is added. And you can see um, it takes a while specifically because the core trust seal procedure sometimes takes up to a year or so to be, to be finished. Um, what are the ongoing activities of the assessment committee? First of all, there's uh, traditionally two assessment rounds each year, one in spring, around April, one in autumn, end of October. Um, and then the uh, idea is also to assist the centers to meet the requirements and to, uh, you know, give a bit of um, evaluation uh, early on to tell them, okay, yeah, we should, this is uh, requirement hasn't been fully fulfilled. Can you please adjust that? It's often a few smaller things, technical things, but it's the details that make the difference between a working infrastructure or something that is not working. So it's really crucial. Um, yeah, it, as I said, I mean, it goes through the stages, self-assessment, uh, evaluation, and then finally the core trust. Um, what are the plans for the next period? Uh, first of all, to streamline the assessment procedure. Um, and that also is about, for instance, uh, the clearer report. So just making sure the style, the layout is uh, adjusted and an and optimally usable state. Um, it's also about um, adapting the assessment criteria and looking a bit into um, yeah, keeping a good balance between making sure all the requirements are there. And on the other hand, sometimes doing updates that are required. There's an interesting discussion currently going on with the standards committee on the topic of uh, whether or not should be checked, whether um, the center has registered its preferred formats in the standards information uh, systems. 
Finally, um, there's also a kind of continuous evaluation round of the core trust seal process and uh, yeah, analyzing the added value of the whole uh, process. Uh, people who were yesterday in the uh, center committee can uh, indeed also testify that there was a lot of discussion about this. And I think it's good to keep a kind of critical and sharp eye on uh, the processes that we have and the external uh, assessment procedures that we are using, especially because this can, yeah, it can cost a lot of time and effort, uh, sometimes frustration, you know, when the reviewer uh, has a different opinion or inconsistent uh, parts of feedback. So this is something we are continuously monitoring. Um, still, it's perceived as very valuable step uh, because it's a kind of really external assessment that is taking place um yeah and i mean it, this is a kind of continuous uh, thing in, in in interaction also with the centers to trying to find out um you know what kind of requirement changes there are sometimes because oh, over time the the quarter steel requirements uh, change slightly so it's a matter of making sure uh yeah what you respond is is in line with what is uh, required um, and finally, also the idea is to organize peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, review before the submission in such a way that uh, the obvious mistakes or problems are already uh, showing up earlier in the process so that the whole uh, process can be further smoothened. Um, yeah, that's it for the assessment committee. Uh, now it's, I think it's time for the knowledge infrastructure committee and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to tell you about the key achievements of the Knowledge Infrastructure uh, Committee in, in, well, the last part of last year, in, in a year's time, yeah. Uh, we work closely with Clarin Management, and by this I understand the BOD and the office, and thereby we are a bit different from what you saw in the organigram. We also have, uh, we also doing things, not only giving advice to BOD, but we also have our own uh, responsibilities. Okay. We also special in the way that we only have seven, max seven members. Uh, so we do not represent all the countries or all the case centers or whatever. Uh, so it's a smaller committee. Uh, but of course, the case centers are a very important part of our portfolio and they provide expertise, as you know, and I've given you the link, I suppose you will get access to these slides afterwards, uh, to the way you can see all our case centers. In the period, we have uh, uh, received several applications and two new case centers have been approved. Mm -hmm. One for Lerner Corpora, that's based in Belgium and one for the Ukrainian language that's based in Germany. Maybe that's temporary, I don't, I don't know, but for the time being, it's based in Germany. This means that we now have 27 case centers and we have two more in the pipeline. And actually one of them was approved uh, yesterday by the uh, committee but then it has to go through also a BOD approval, and therefore I did not count it today. But that last one uh, is for Croatian language. Uh, and then we have uh, we've had a third uh, a virtual workshop for case centers uh, last year in December. Uh, and um, this year, we are having the first face-to-face -face workshop for case centers after this conference. We are very, very happy about this. Um, I would also say that uh, we have, um, this is maybe something we are testing out, uh, the, these midterm meetings. We have such uh, meetings every three years, more serious meetings, you can say, with the case centers when they uh, need to have their certificate renewed. But these meetings have been so successful, so useful for both parties that we thought we could offer case centers also midterm meetings. Um, this is something we are doing. Uh, and then we have updated our bylaws, and in May we got three new members, and since we have maxed 
uh, seven members. That's uh, half of the membership. And this is good, I think, for renewal, uh, but not to renew everyone at the same time. Ongoing activities. Well, with case centers, I've already told you a bit of what we're doing with case centers, I, and I'm not, not going to repeat that, but you can see the list of things here. But also there's a question with 27 or soon 28 centers, we are kind of reaching a reasonable uh, amount of case centers. But do we have the right case centers? Are there any areas missing? And there, I mean, you, you saw that we are seven in the uh, committee. So if uh, that's not a lot. So if any of you have ideas, you think we are missing something, come and talk to me during the conference or send me an email. Um, then uh, another ongoing activity is our best practice papers that we started last year. Uh, we are collecting them, we are maintaining them. I give a, this, uh, a, a link here so that you can see what we have until now. This is uh, growing gradually, uh, not very fast, but it's growing. And of course, uh, an ongoing activity is this uh, visibility yeah. of the clearing expertise, not only case centers, but all kinds of knowledge that we have. And then we are also taking care of the mobility grants. We have to promote them. I hope you have received uh, calls for that. And uh, we also evaluate uh, applications. Now for next year, it's of course a lot of continuing the same thing, but we want, and I was happy to see that Krista also mentioned that as an NCF task, better integration of case centers in the Clarion community. And therefore, I'm, I, I want to repeat that. I'm so happy that we'll have the workshop and we have so many case centers present here uh, because that helps uh, uh, to be seen and to be known by the rest of the community. Um, and uh, well, the next uh, bullet I have already talked about. And we also collaborate with uh, those responsible on the clearing website because currently uh, we, we have not yet reached a, a good uh, structure for the uh, knowledge infrastructure but we are working on that uh, and then we will organize uh, case center workshops uh, and maybe other types of smaller meetings and investigate other ways of supporting the case centers and their collaboration with Clearing. Uh, mobility grants again. And then the last thing I want to mention is that uh, we want uh, to promote the trainers network uh, and other collaboration with Clearing Office. Here I should say the case centers participation in that because otherwise the rest is done by other people. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Paweł Kamocki, and I have the honor of chairing the Clarin Legal and Ethical Issues Committee, also known as um, the CLIC. So, what have we done and what have we achieved in uh, 2023? The slide may not uh, look particularly impressive, uh, but uh, what's in there, it's uh, really something. And I, as uh, chair, I'm really proud of um, our 2023. We have organized in April um, a, a Clarin Cafe uh, entitled Do Chatbots Dream of Copyright? Um, that was about the copyright status of um, outputs of generative AI, like ChatGPT. Um, and uh, why I'm particularly proud of this event is that we uh, managed to have an excellent lineup of presenters. Uh, we had a presentation of, from um, uh, Thomas Margoni, a professor of IT law uh, from Leuven, actually, uh, th this university uh, here, um, as well as a presentation from uh, Toby Bond, uh, who was uh, labeled one of the most influential uh, lawyers under 40 year, years of age uh, in the UK. 
uh, partner at uh, Bird and Bird. So really uh, an excellent lineup uh, of presenters for our cafe. And I do think that the cafe went extremely well and you can find it on uh, YouTube. Um, as a committee, we have also published a joint uh, paper for the Claren Annual Conference and will be presented on uh, Wednesday um, with uh, Chris Linden and yours truly as uh, co-authors, among others. Um, what are our ongoing activities? Uh, well, we are, as a committee, uh, we are involved in the Eureka initiative that will be officially launched um, tomorrow with the kickoff uh, workshop. Um, and as you might have already heard, and you will, those of you who will attend the workshop will hear all the details tomorrow. Uh, this is the initiative aimed at uh, creating a European reference corpus. Um, which will undoubtedly uh, come with uh, an array of legal issues uh, that uh, we can only anticipate now, but uh, we are very much looking forward to handling uh, as the, the initiative progresses. We are also involved in the Clarin and Libraries Initiative. Um, during our meeting, we started discussing ethical implications of uh, artificial intelligence and i do hope that it will lead eventually to a taxonomy of ethical issues related to uh, artificial intelligence and uh, a checklist for uh, stakeholders we are also uh, still discussing uh, text and data mining exceptions uh, and the um, practical functioning for uh, Clarence centers. Um, and our goals for 2024 is to continue to work on ethical issues in AI. Uh, you know, 2023 was the year of rabbit, uh, but it was also, uh, it is actually a year of artificial intelligence. And we do hope that 2024, we do think that 2024 will also be a year of artificial intelligence. Uh, so uh, I think this kind of input from the click is, is timely. Uh, we do hope to organize a Clarin Cafe on the issue. Uh, again, with invited uh, guests, and we would like to have uh, maybe a trained ethician, a trained uh, philosopher, because I think those um, uh, this this expertise is actually absent in Click uh, currently, but we do hope to uh, get the perspective from someone trained in uh, academically trained in in ethics, and we do hope it will also lead to uh, publication. Regarding the text and data mining exception, we will continue gathering uh, use cases and success stories as well as failure. Uh, stories uh, to um, map uh, what is going well and what is still going wrong with the text and data mining exception that we've been waiting for for so long. We will still be involved in uh, Eureka, uh, which will be a, a huge success, we hope. Um, and especially in 2024, uh, this is something that we try not to hypothesize about too much, uh, but uh, the, the Artificial Intelligence Act is actually expected to be adopted by the end of this year. And then we will have, uh, we will spend most of 2024 uh, analyzing it letter by letter, sentence by sentence, section by section, article by article, section by section. So. Uh, there will definitely be uh, a lot of work for us and you'll be hearing from us at the next conference, of course, and hopefully before that as well, do join our next cafe uh, in 2024. Thank you very much. That's everything from me. And I'll leave the floor to my learned colleague, uh, Piotr Bański. Uh, my name is Piotr Bański. I chair the... Uh what was previously known as the Standards Committee and is now the Standards and Interoperability Committee. 
Uh, and this is what the first bullet in the first slide is about. Uh, we have, uh, around the beginning of the year, we have merged with the interoper interoperability task force and, well, explicitly embraced interoper interoperability as one of the main foci. I have trained the pronunciation of this word uh, since January, and I'm almost there. Uh, and yeah, and so we have changed the name. Uh, we have been through several releases of the standards information system that's already been mentioned today. Uh, adding new features uh, meant to make life uh, or make it more attractive for uh, center representatives and also uh, provide support for infrastructures other than Clarin. Uh, and the next bullet should be a sub-bullet uh, because uh, uh, it's worth mentioning uh, that the standardization working group of text plus collections slice uh, is going to give uh, the sys a try. Uh, we have heard, uh, we have held the first inputon uh, in Mannheim at, at IDS Mannheim. Uh, that is a little event uh, meant at producing a complete set of uh, recommendations for uh, uh, data deposition formats. Uh, this happened for the textual subset of IDS uh, depositions. And well, maybe not a huge key achievement uh, in uh, 23, but still uh, worth mentioning uh, because it took a while. Uh, the standards uh, information system got listed by firstsharing.org as a knowledge base. Uh, the ongoing activities, uh, apart from the statutory monitoring activity, uh, is to continue work on the standards information system and keeping in touch with the centers committee and the assessment committee. Uh, and uh, we have towards the uh, beginning of the summer, uh, we have initiated the process of the revival of what probably all of you uh, know, uh, uh, one of the first, or maybe the first, uh, linguistic ontology called GOLD uh, is going to be revived under the Clarin label. Uh, we're in the process of uh, taking over from the linguist list and making it alive again. Uh, so, so the first goal is to not only to provide a platform for uh, new uh, initiatives to be able to um, to reference data categories that are somehow uniformly agreed on, uh, but also to to make it possible for uh, past deliverables that are still out there to start functioning again to. Um, uh, to be more interoperable by reviving uh, the facility of uh, being able to point to to a certain set of uh, agreed data categories. Uh, yeah. And uh, the plans for uh, for the coming year are basically to continue to pursue the work on. Uh, making the SIS a more essential and useful part of the Clarin infrastructure, to relaunch uh, the gold ontology, uh, to continue our statutory goals, that is monitoring the development and use of standards, and hopefully also to expand, and, to, and in this way to allow more consortia to influence the standards-related dynamics and to timely react, react to de the developments in the field. And with, with this, I thank you. And Maria is going to be our next speaker. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Maria Gavrilidou, and I am the chair of the uh, User Involvement Committee of Clarin. Uh, the User Involvement Committee is one of the big committees, as it consists of one representative per country, both member countries and observer countries. So um, 
we are a big committee. We meet twice annually as a body and we have shorter meetings between ourselves as needed. We had our first annual meeting, which was virtual in March. And we had our second meeting yesterday in the uh, morning. Uh, what we uh, do and what our key achievements in 2023 were is that we collect collected information on user involvement activities at the national level. And it was an impressive number of activities, as was the number of participants in this conference. We had an increase of by 132% in national activities organized in 2023 as compared to 2022. Uh, what else did we do? We tried to redesign the uh, user involvement activities typology that we use to record these um, activities so that we have a standard and common uh, way to understand what we need to record and how we need to record it. We uh, promoted uh, national UI activities towards Clarin Central and on the contrary, promoted and disseminated Clarin Central activities to the national networks. We were, we were in close collaboration with the BOD and the Clarin officers regarding UI activities. And we organized in collaboration with uh, Clarin Central, uh, a Clarin Cafe, a, type of CAFE seminar on the topic, topic of exploring the potential of digital tools for learning. This was the topic that was the choice of the members of the committee. Finally, we participated in the Clarin Strategy Days this June in Ljubljana. Our ongoing activities now include the continuation of recording of UI activities at the national uh, level, the uh, adoption and the modifications needed to the uh, new typology and the promotion of uh, client activities through social media, through blogs, uh, horizontally between countries and uh, vertically from Clarin Center to National Consortia and from National Consortia to Clarin Eric. Our key goals now and the plans for 2024 is that to come up together with the uh, uh, Clarin uh, BOD and the NCF with a user engagement strategy for Clarin, how we can manage to engage more users and uh, at the national level and at the central level. Uh, we need to align our UI initiatives with the KPIs that are needed from us by S3 and other bodies, funding bodies, so that we plan activities that are in accordance to the KPIs that we would need to produce. We will, of course, uh, um, continue to uh, collect information, but we need to start collecting information now, not only on the activities that we uh, organize and implement, but on our users, who they are, who our user base is, and then based on that, to design an outreach strategy to engage those users, those types of users. Uh, we also intend to uh, exchange experiences and good practices among ourselves. And uh, I mean, at the level of the committee, but also with our users as well. And of course, we uh, plan to organize our annual seminar which is intended for the uh, committee, but not also it's open for everyone. That's all from me. Thank you very much.